ጤነስጥነን የተከበራችሁ አድማጭ ተመልካቾቻችን የአዲስ ቀኝት የሚዲያ አገልግሎት ነው ለዛሬው ይዘንላችሁ የቀረብነው ከፊታችን የሰኔ 14 የሚከሄደውን የኢትዮጵያ ምርጫን ምክንያት በማድረግ በዚህ በቶሮንቶ ካናዳ ዲሞክራሲ ሃውስ እና አዲስ ቀኝት የሚዲያ አገልግሎት በመተባበር ያዘጋጁትን የዙም ውይይት ነው ገዛህኝ መኮንን ይዞላችሁ ይቀርባል የመጀመሪያውን ክፍል አድማጮቻችን ይህ ውይይት የተካሄደው በእንግሊዘኛ ነው ሼር ላይክ ሰብስክራይብ ኮሜንት ያደረጋችሁ ከኛ ጋራ አብራችሁን እንድትቆዩ ባክብሮት እንጋብዛለን መልካም ጊዜ Good evening and thank you for joining us for the first of three conversations on the search for democracy in Ethiopia. My name is Mark Campbell. I'm a founder of Democracy House, which began a little more than 2 years ago. We're a multi-partisan movement that promotes respectful dialogue and engagement on democratic issues, rights and responsibilities at home and abroad. Democratic Democracy House was conceived of in Toronto, the world's first 50-50 city, meaning that when you meet someone here there's an even chance that they will not even have been born in Canada. One of the things I love about living here is that your friends, neighbors and people you engage with on a daily basis can be from just about anywhere in the world. The opportunity to learn from those who have very different perspectives than our own is available if we engage. Last Canada Day I took a walk in Hyde Park with some neighbors including Gazan Demissi who I just met with sparkling eyes indicating a beaming smile beneath his mask he told us that on Canada Day 5 years ago he had become a Canadian citizen and was so happy and grateful to be here learning that he's a journalist writer filmmaker and radio host focused on human rights we began speaking about democracy house and our hopes of expanding globally Gazan attended a conversation series Democracy House hosted in February. Inspired by that series, he approached me to ask if we might host a similar series for Ethiopia prior to the upcoming elections, which we understand have been postponed once more. Perhaps that's a good thing as this provides more time to engage, understand and encourage democratic values in Ethiopia. We will record this series of keynote addresses which will be available for you to send to friends and family if you'd like. I'd now like to introduce Gazan Demissi, executive director of Bridge Entertainment, New Perspective and the moderator of this series on the future of democracy in Ethiopia. Gazan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you Mark for your kind introduction. It is a collaboration event between Democracy House and the New Perspective at Diskenyet Ethiopian Media Service. It is a unique collaboration which is symbolic that shows a people to people engagement between Canada and Ethiopia. Ethiopia is scheduled to vote in national elections June 14, 2021. This will be happening amid both a war in the northern territory of Tigray and the pandemic the elections were already delayed once last year due to covid this is not a conversation about the challenges of democracy in canada not even in north america it is about an ancient country which survives for 3 millennia as a free state in the african continent but still striving to establish a democracy where new and young countries like canada become an established democracy and prosperous but an ancient country like ethiopia is languishing in the backward ethnic based political system but as a person who can enjoy and benefit from the canadian democratic system and learn from the matured and free canadian society i ask why ethiopia and the rest of undemocratic societies elsewhere didn't get the chance is it because curse or is it because the society is not matured enough for that kind of political system but my observation and experience tells me that if ethiopians get a fair and free election and vibrant constitution of course they will become a democratic society they proved this in 2005 election which was rigged by the then autocratic and ethnic oriented government led by tplf i was a journalist and observer of that vibrant election which gave hope for most if not all ethiopians a glimmer of hope 
but it was unfortunate. It was turned down, and since then, decent voices were oppressed until the current interim government came to power and opened the space and released prisoners and allow opposition leaders abroad to come back home. In my lifetime, I witnessed five elections in Ethiopia, but all of them was fake and rigged. And the one before the upcoming one was a 100% victory for the ruling party, and it was a laughing stock of the world. Ethiopia and Ethiopians tried so far all kinds of government, monarchy, communist, dictatorship, military junta, and ethnic based. But all of them did not work out. The only system that never examined is the democratic one. During the imperial time, it was believed, stated by the emperor, that the people of Ethiopia was not ready to select its own leaders. So the emperor elected on behalf of them. But how about now? After I came to Canada, I learned that democracy is not something that comes from above, but from below. Unfortunately, for the last 50 years, Ethiopians didn't get a chance to be a free society. I urge not the Canadian government or any Western government to stand with Ethiopians, but the people of Canada, because it is the people who is the source of political power in this part of the world. From my stay in Canada, I can witness that the people of Canada is kind, free and democratic. And it's this value that I want to transfer and bridge to Ethiopia, my homeland. I hope these same people should have to show support and urge for other people to enjoy the fruits of democracy as well. With this, I would like to introduce you with tonight's keynote speaker, Jeremy Kensman. Jeremy Kensman, born in Montreal, was in the Canadian Foreign Services for 40 years the last 15 as our ambassador in Moscow, Rome, London, and Brussels at European Union. Before his appointment as ambassador, he had been minister at the Canadian Embassy in Washington and at the United Nations in New York. Since leaving the public service in 2006, Jeremy has concurrently been diplomat in residence at Princeton University, his alma mater, Regents Lecturer and Resident International Scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, and a Distinguished Visitor at Ryerson University in Toronto. From 2007 to 2017, he directed an international democracy support program that published a diplomat's handbook for democracy development support. He was also a member of Prime Minister Trudeau's Foreign Affairs Council. Jeremy is a frequent media contributor and appears regularly on CTV. He is a distinguished fellow of the Canadian International Council, for which he is currently organizing a year-long consultation between Canadian and German civil society on democracy, inclusive pluralism, human rights defense, and cooperative multilateralism. Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm very humbly on this virtual floor, Gazan. I'm very honored to be, uh, to be sharing it with you. And uh, I'm very moved by your, your report on, uh, on what Ethiopia has gone through and is going through. I, I don't know Ethiopia well, but I've tried in the last few days to, to find out more, to get a, a deeper sense of its kind of human features and its aspirations. And uh, indeed, uh, I don't think I or, or anybody can do much more for you than help you to have the best for yourselves that you can get. You know, democracy can't be exported. That was a big mistake we made back in the 90s. It's got to be developed. It's got to be built. And, and the building block, uh, Gezan, uh, as you as you and I were discussing the other day, is civil society. What's civil society? Uh, this experience right now is civil society. You know, the YMHA or the YMCA is civil society. 
Parents Teachers Association, or Little League Baseball, the sorts of things that, that people do together freely uh, as kind of mini communities. That is what it needs to thrive. And as you explained to me in Ethiopia uh, over the last many years, civil society has really been suppressed to the extent that it exists. The government tries to, to run it and to run people's affairs. Look, we're going through a tough time now. I think that, that, that differences uh, between people, even in our own country, uh, are, are so, so apparent now. Of course, the most obvious difference is between the sick and the well. But we've been talking now for, for years, ever since the financial crisis, particularly of 2008, of the, the differences in wealth that people have, the differences between the vulnerable and the very, very wealthy. You know, we, we've been talking uh, uh, this summer, uh, last summer, last year, so much about Black Lives Matter and First Nations uh, issues in Canada, about the differences in identity. Who's included and who feels excluded? And, and, and these differences uh, seem increasingly uh, to kind of control our, our, our discourse. Let me tell you that there's probably one difference that, that is very, very fundamental in the world. And that's the difference between people who are free and people who are not free. And I'm going to tell you some grim statistics about that uh, today. But I'm always reminded uh, in this discussion about democracy and, and freedom. And I'm not talking about the freedom to be an anti-masker or an anti-vaxxer or that, that, that isn't the kind of freedom I'm talking about. I'm talking about the basic things that, that are the foundations of people's lives. I think the greatest speech about this that was ever made was made by Franklin Roosevelt when the United States entered the Second World War in 1941. And he wanted people to understand what, what the sacrifices that were coming were for. And, and they were for, of course, defeating the enemy, uh, you know, that, uh, that was apparent. But they were for something else. And he gave what is called the Four Freedoms speech. And the freedoms uh, he was talking about are very simple, but they still deserve thought. There are two freedoms of and two freedoms from. The freedoms of are fundamental civil rights freedom of speech and expression, and freedom of worship. But the freedom from that he was talking about, the two, are, are very fundamental. And we forget sometimes that it's freedom from want and freedom from fear. You know, uh, a great uh, anthropologist, uh, Abraham Maslow, about that time in 1943, uh, tried to articulate what he called the hierarchy of needs. The hierarchy of needs to be psychologically integrated, both as people, as individuals, and even as a society. And it's interesting to me, it always has been, that at the top of his list of needs are security and safety. And in, in that list of five needs is also the need for dignity or fairness, if you want. Freedom is an elusive uh, concept. Uh, if, it, if it comes, if people try to have freedom at the expense of security and safety, it won't be accepted. You know, in Tahrir Square in Cairo, at the beginning of perhaps the high point of the Arab Spring 10 years ago, you didn't hear the word democracy among the people who were camped there in, in Tahrir Square. What you heard was the word fairness and dignity. And fairness and dignity, they, they infer treatment of people by other people and by the government of respect. They infer accountability for people who have office. They infer transparency. These are things which uh, Ethiopians 
I think uh, every poll, scholars do an awful lot of polling in countries you, 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 you would find it difficult to believe polling could be done, but they do it. And they find that humans, no matter who they are, where they are, or their conditions, they want these same things. They want fairness. They want freedom, but they want freedom from fear. They want freedom from want. They want security. You know, things uh, have not gone well uh, for democracy in the last several years. Uh, the, the, uh, the administration of Donald Trump was a, a complete disaster for democracy because American democracy lost its exemplary leadership value to others. But uh, maybe uh, let's hope that the Ethiopian uh, election can uh, show the beginning of a comeback. Because right now, where we are in terms of the freedom index is roughly, unfortunately, where we were in 1989-1990. We have gone backwards. True liberal democracies right now, I'm sorry to give you the bad news, but only represent 14% of the people uh, on this earth. Of course, that's partly because they're you know, the, the, the huge populations of 1.4 1, 1. Uh, billion of, of, both, of both China, which is certainly not a democracy, and India, which is to some extent a compromised democracy right now, uh, affect the percentages. But the, the numbers of liberal democracies have gone down from 41 to 32. The number of autocracies now, now represent uh, uh, 68% of the people in the world. And, uh, and these, these autocracies, by the way, have elections. Uh, as as Gozan just said, they're apt to be phony elections, but people seek to lit legitimize themselves through elections. And they actually uh, account for 87 states. Well, in those places, uh, uh, opposition is suppressed, the civil society is suppressed, voters uh, are uh, suppressed and intimidated, and uh, people, uh, people who take power very often, who, who get elected, find that uh, in the course of exercising power, they begin to backslide. They begin to attack the media as being enemies of the people. They attack civil society. They polarize society uh, by disrespecting uh, sometimes even dehumanizing their opponents, and they spread disinformation and false information, and they undermine the formal institutions of democracy that are meant to provide the, the checks and the balances to provide that accountability that is so important. Why did I get involved in this stuff? I was Canada's ambassador, and uh, actually I was sent to Moscow as the ambassador to the Soviet Union, but by the time I got there, uh, it was 14 different countries. So I, I was the ambassador, not just to Russia, but to an awful lot of countries that uh, were uh, initially pretending, most of them, uh, to aspire to democracy. A few of them made it, and most of them didn't. And the one, of course, that was sort of heartbreaking for those of us who lived there in Russia was Russia itself. It wasn't because of the Russians. It wasn't because there's something inbuilt in them that, that disqualifies them from appreciating the value of democracy or, or knowing how, how to practice it. It is simply this, that democracy isn't something that you can download. It's not an app that you can simply extend to somebody. It has to be lived. It has to be grown. And it takes time. It's tough, and it, it is never perfect. Uh, as Isabella Allende, the great Chilean writer, said once, democracy is like husbands. There's always room for improvement, and that's true. But uh, democracy is also very elusive. What it is is behavioral, okay? It is not necessarily institutional. We can try to uh, channel institutional history and capability, capacity, but what it takes really is behavior. The great legal scholar, Tom Carruthers, who's at Carnegie in New York, uh, said once that it's not about courts, it's not about statutes, it's about what's in citizens' heads and how it 
how does it get into citizens' heads? It gets there uh, through practice over time. When I was in Moscow, I uh, had a conversation with a man I got to know because my wife was a Czech political refugee, and uh, she introduced him uh, to me when I was political director at our foreign ministry way back 30 years ago, after uh, Václav Havel uh, had become the president of, of a newly free Czechoslovakia. And when he came to Russia, I would uh, see him. And at one time he came in uh, 1995, and he said to me, he asked me rather, I guess, sarcastically, he said, well, how's your democracy coming? How's How's this Russian democracy coming? And I said, well, you know, it's, 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 they're working. It's hard. It's a tough slog, but uh, they're working at it. And he said, oh, yeah, well, uh, give them 60 years, 60 years. I thought that was very harsh, uh, too pessimistic. I later found out that, that what he was talking about was something that came from a writer called Ralph Darendorf, uh, that uh, when a, a new government, a new government of the kind that Ethiopia has, uh, takes power and attempts a democracy, it takes about six months to kind of get its mission articulated and get it right. And it takes about, uh, you know, six years uh, to build the institutions and to build the economic practices that go along with that. But it can take 60 years for citizens' heads to catch up and for their behavior to change. It's tough. There's a big learning curve. And how does the learning curve get, it, get accelerated? It gets accelerated through civil society. I'll tell you one more story, one more anecdote. I was in uh, Cuba about, uh, I guess, eight years ago on a, a writing project. I was writing Cuba up as a, actually as a case study for our book. And I was uh, under the radar writing about Cuba for the New York Times. And I got a, a meeting, uh, a very cherished meeting, uh, with the great Cardinal Ortega, of, of uh, Cardinal of Cuba. And he, he, he told me there in his palace, uh, though the microphones were on and stuff, he, 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 he let me know, he knew what, what I was after. And he sent me, he said, I want you to go uh, to, to a parish project I have. And the government of Cuba, Raul Castro, who had been rather more generous the Catholic Church and his older brother, Fidel, uh, had asked uh, Cardinal Ortega, because of the overload of daycare centers uh, in Cuban uh, social services, if the church couldn't uh, perhaps help out and run, uh, 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 enable uh, these, uh, these young, often single women to, uh, to have daycare centers and parish uh, parish precincts. And so I went to one of these and I saw immediately what he was talking about. I saw young women, barely girls, really, 19, 20 years old, young mothers. Uh, and they were, you know what they were doing? For the first time in their lives, in their whole lives, they were together running something of great consequence to their lives. They were in charge of something about their lives. And that is called agency. They had agency. And what, what, what democracy needs is for citizens to feel that they have agency over their own lives and can do the right thing for themselves and for others and for the society. Uh, and what they, they learn in that experience in civil society is they learn how to compromise. The great problem with the Arab Spring in Tahrir Square, those good, good, good people in Tahrir Square, was that the, the so-called reformers, they, they couldn't agree among themselves on what to do other than getting power, getting Mubarak out of power. You know, it said that the easy part of revolution is getting rid of the dictator. dictator. The tough part is what starts the morning afterward. What is necessary and what can we do? We can't export our democracy, but we can help the Ethiopians perhaps learn uh, a little bit of, of what we do that, that they can adapt because you can't imitate somebody else if you're going to be authentic in your own country. 
we can do that. We can provide funds. I had, I, because of this, I, I wrote my friend who's our ambassador uh, in Ethiopia. And I said, you know, tell me something you've heard uh, from Ethiopians. And he told me what a, what a minister uh, said to him uh, the other day. He said, you know, don't tell us, don't preach to us about democracy. Give us the tools. Help us to get the tools to have it. And that's what I think we can do. I think democracies together have to exercise solidarity. I'm not looking for any new cold wars against other countries, but I am looking for consistency among democracies in calling out violations of human rights. Human rights, and I'm talking about human civil rights, those are the building blocks, those are fundamentally necessary uh, to democracy. And uh, we must be resolute about that. You know, the difference between human rights and, and trying to uh, export or promote democracy is that human rights, uh, human rights can be litigated. Human rights are things that are in covenants that almost all countries in the world have signed on to, though far too many only pay lip service to them. And so that is very, very necessary. But every country's trajectory here is going to be different. You know, no two countries are alike. Uh, countries have human features. They might have federal features. Ethiopia has huge ethnic differences that is, to some extent, can be problematic. We have them in Canada, too. And uh, our democracy, the most fundamental feature of it, is that it's inclusive. And my only advice to them is theirs has to be inclusive as well. But you, you Canadians, we Canadians, we do have a responsibility because the best way we can help is not our government to Ethiopian people. That's resisted in some countries. It is you to Ethiopian people. It's civil society to civil society. If I could change uh, what we do in Canada in one way that would be very important, I would insist that at least a third of our development assistance budget, some of which goes to the sort of uh, features of, of society that, that, that build democracy, I would insist that a third of it be administered by our civil society directly to their civil society society. So it's civil society to civil society. And it doesn't have to be political things. It can be normal, mundane things, running your city, running your schools, running your health system, running your courts, making things work, building confidence that, that, that the Democrats know what to do. Because what happened in Russia was that the Democrats wanted to do it, but they were coming from another place altogether and they didn't know how. And let me tell you, we didn't know how either. And we don't know how Ethiopia should develop. That's up to Ethiopians. But we can at least give those Ethiopians the tools, the support, and the solidarity from start to finish so that their election isn't again another election of, of uh, somebody who says he's a Democrat, but once uh, who has, he has power, finds that he has to uh, subtract the, 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 the small amounts of democratic space that have been recently obtained. So I hope uh, this is, uh, I don't know if it's wisdom, I can tell you it's experience over uh, many years and innumerable workshops and uh, other other what will I say, uh, uh, sites of, of people's genuine effort to, to have what, what everybody wants. It's not, it's not democracy. It, it, you know, Ethiopia isn't going to be Ontario. Uh, Ontario isn't, isn't going to be uh, Taiwan. I mean, we're different, different countries, and, but, but we, we share same basic human values. So I, I congratulate Democracy House for your, first of all, your very existence. Um, and I, I wish you luck. And I, I, I hope you grow because you will grow 
if, if the way you communicate and help others grows. So I, I wish you Godspeed. And, and I'm, I've got to say, Gwazan, I, I've learned from you. And this is all about mutual learning. It's not about one sort of type of society teaching another. We got to learn together. And we'll learn as much from you as you'll learn from us. And that's starting uh, for me with meeting you just in the last few days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, for this wonderful uh, insight and uh, key, keynote Thank speech. Thank you so much. That, that was very enlightening um, and very inspiring, Jeremy. Um, greatly appreciate that. And the question that comes to mind, um, we have a couple questions coming in, but the first question that comes to mind is, Jason, can you tell us about what action is going on at the grassroots level, which is what Jeremy mentioned was so important, to promote education for youth and school school age children to understand democracy. Are there any civil um, civil or political science programs available to students in Ethiopia? In Ethiopia, you know, my experience is, uh, you know, from five years back. Uh, when I was there, uh, there was an ethics uh, education in the school system. Uh, but unfortunately, the education system is uh, highly uh, politicized and highly manipulated by the ideology of the ruling party or the, you know, the government the current government in power. But as a civil society, there are some uh, groups who try to uh, encourage and try to uh, start, you know, this kind of activities here and there. Uh, for instance, I and my friends try to establish uh, Pen Ethiopia. It's an international NGO working for human rights and literature. And uh, the first thing we did in 2000, uh, 12 was to start a reading uh, program in the elementary schools in, in Addis Ababa, uh, which is the capital city of the Ethiopia. And we try to encourage students to, to think freely and to read and to examine you know, what's going on uh, around them and uh, in other parts of the world, believing that we, that is the foundation for a free society and a free thinking. But unfortunately, because of the draconian uh, law, uh, which was in place after the 2005 election, uh, civil societies and medias were uh, not allowed to, to teach about rights. So we were finally uh, closed down by, by the government. So there are different uh, starts here and there, but there is no uh, continuity or it doesn't sustain. Thank you for that. And um, Jeremy, one of the things I've heard you speak about um, previously is that um, we can export the tools to assist countries in their um, building a democracy and education is of course a huge part of this. You had mentioned that um, trade organizations and uh, that those are very uh, crucial. Um, you had also mentioned, though, that, um, you know, we all have human rights understanding and those are litigatable. Uh, they can be litigated, but litigatable. <laughs> I don't think that's a good word. <laughs> litigated. But um, when it comes to forming uh, unions and guilds and things like that, um, that's kind of the step that hopefully would you think that should be available after school, after education, for a country like Ethiopia that's trying to emerge into a democracy, especially since you said it takes six years. Is that something that you would recommend? It should, it should be. It was old Vaxoff Havel who, uh, who had the six years uh, idea, but, but, you know, maybe he wasn't so wrong. Um, the, the one thing was very uh, revealing about the Arab Spring. One country did it. One country succeeded. It was Tunisia. Uh, you know, it's still tough. I mean, our democracy is tough. Look at American democracy, you know. Uh, and I'll, I'll just say to Gazan, your question of him 
about to what extent are what Americans call civics taught in school. Uh, I was the member of a council in Washington that ran our project. I was there talking about this stuff for a decade. And during that time, the teaching of civics in the United States in high schools virtually disappeared. And it disappeared because school boards couldn't agree on the role of government and what was the correct uh, thing to say. That wouldn't happen in Canada. But, but it, is, it, it was simply revealing. Uh, I think that some of the problems in America today is because there is no common kind of assumption about, about civics. But anyway, you asked me about, about something else. Uh, and I would say that Tunisia succeeded because despite the fact it had had kind of a semi-benign, if, if kleptocratic autocracies, uh, monarchies uh, for, for many decades. Uh, it had always had exactly what you're talking about, trade unions. It, it was uh, one of the uh, uh, Muslim countries uh, in which uh, women were most resolutely uh, independent and that it had it, the civil society it had uh, active and independent bar associations and and teachers associations and pro professional associations that enabled people in that experience to learn the value of compromise and to learn uh, how to to manage things in in uh, apartheid south africa when the black South Africans weren't allowed by the regime to organize themselves in anything, they only had two things that were permitted. They could organize their own funerals, which is for somebody my age, if you remember those times, those funerals became enormous political events because they were the only ones that were permitted. And they could, they could have, they could organize and have their own football clubs. And it's in those football clubs that the anti-apartheid ANC movement was, was really uh, so enormously uh, bolstered because it's there that people got together as equals, as peers, and decided their own things and learned uh, how to create a program, how to compromise to make that program happen. So that's the value of... Uh, of civil society, we we can only help to we can help uh, to some extent. We can encourage and connect to those organizations and support them and make sure they prosper. I mean, it's not up to us to influence them. Uh, even financing financing is suspect in many countries, but we can we can relate our uh, uh, equivalent of of of. Uh, that 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 you know of the football clubs and their football clubs, or our our equivalent of trades unions uh, and theirs. Uh, you know, working people have things in common, no matter what they're working at. They have the same expectations. They have the same uh, needs. They have the same obligations to their family to earn a living. They have the same need for meritocracy at work for fairness. These are things that we can inculcate, you know, and, uh, and, and that's, I don't know if it's a total answer to your question, but I think we, we have to create those bridges. They're terribly important to us as much as to them. Thank you for that, Jeremy. That's um, very much uh, fascinating ideas and so many ideas about how we could move forward with this. And speaking of bridges, um, <laughs> Gazan uh, and his, uh, you know, work uh, with Bridge uh, Entertainment uh, that he, uh, his news organization here, he is all about building bridges. የተከበራችሁ አድማጭ ተመልካቾቻችን የክፍል አንዱ ቆይታችን ያያችሁትን ይመስላል ጥሩ ጊዜ ከኛ ጋር አንዳሳልፋችሁ ተስፋ እናደርጋለን በቀጣይ ደግሞ በክፍል ሁለት እንገናኛለን እስከዛው ድረስ ሼር ላይክ ሰብስክራይብ ኮሜንት ስላረጋችሁን ከልብና መሰግናለን ሰላም ሆኑ